In this video, we're going to hear from Henry Bunn. Henry is a professor of anthropology here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he's been my colleague for several years. Henry is one of the world's experts on the earliest cultures, the Oldowan culture, and his fieldwork as an archaeologist at Olduvai Gorge has helped to uncover many of the subsistence practices of very early humans. In this video, we're going to see him in the field as he tells us about the site and its history. It's a really exciting chance to see fieldwork in action. Olduvai is the premier field area uh, in Africa or on the planet then uh, for understanding the behavior of uh, our own genus, early Homo, from two to one million years ago. But for understanding behavior, Olduvai is uh, a premier uh, field area uh, because of the, the, the history of research here and because of the quantity and quality of uh, the evidence, the way it was recorded by the leaky so long ago. We are here at the exact spot where in 1959 Mary Leakey found the Zinjanthropus cranium, which is, you, you know what Zinjanthropus was? Yeah, it's a uh, Paranthropus boisea. There you go. Australopithecus boisea now. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so um, up until that point, the, the leakies. Lewis and Mary had been working at Olduvai off and on. It wasn't like an annual thing, but when they had funding, they'd come here and uh, off and on since Lewis's first trip in 1931. Mm -hmm. And they had found a couple of pieces of hominin tooth here and a couple yeah. of pieces there, but and had numbered them so that this fossil became OH Olduvai hominin number five. Uh, but it was the first significant hominid fossil that they found at Olduvai, and so, you know, that ended decades of sort of looking in the sense that um, they knew they were here because they found stone tools for the, all of the time, but they didn't know uh, who was the tool maker, and so they found Paranthropus here, which is, you know, an Australopithecine, and they immediately thought, well, by default, that's the tool maker, yeah. mm -hmm. and um, that was kind of provocative and that it's got an ape-sized brain and you know, so on. Um, but then within a year, 200 meters that way, north, uh, they found the remains of Homo habilis, larger brain hominin, type specimens from there. And so immediately that became the, the more likely candidate as tool maker. You know, Mary found um, the Zinjanspor's cranium one morning when uh, Lewis is back in camp sick, yeah. and she immediately, you know, went rushing back to camp. Uh, you know, I found him, I found him, sort of uh, paraphrasing. Yeah. <laughs> and he was like instantly well, they came back. They <laughs> <laughs> well, even had, had, they even had a, a uh, film guy. But what Lewis did that year was he also, um, in his enthusiasm, started an excavation into the deposit where, where the Zinch cranium was found and established that there was a thin layer of fossil bones of various animals and uh, early stone tools, older one stone tools here. So that ended the 1959 work, but it set up Mary to then excavate this entire area here down to the Zinch level. And so in the process, this is like the largest early uh, archaeological excavation and um, I mean just think of the amount of stuff <laughs> that was removed here it's all solid rock because these, yeah. these resistant layers are, are are tough that do require pick work to, to mm -hmm. get them out and uh, and so for the next uh, year and a half or so she and her team excavated the site which is like 15 meters into the outcrop and 20 meters along the outcrop, so roughly 300 square meters of an ancient land surface on which Zinge died for whatever reason and on which there was this concentration of bones and artifacts. To get there, they had to go through 20, uh, 21 other significant levels that some have uh, are tufts, volcanic yep. ash deposits with no archaeology in them. Uh, some are low density archaeological sites. Mm -hmm. Some are just sites with a few fossils. Um, 
but all most all of it that was productive was dug by hand uh, down to this level which is level 22 and the, as far down as they went at uh, old divide there are deposits that are as old as two million years before the present and extend up toward the present uh, our the focus of our work is really uh, in the deposits that are between about two million and one million years ago, which uh, in geological terms are uh, uh, labeled bed one and bed two. Uh, within those deposits along the sides of the gorge, uh, more than one dozen different uh, rich archaeological and paleontological sites have been found. And uh, we on the project have excavations in uh, about uh, half a dozen of those. We've, we've selected the sites with the best preservation uh, and in contexts where we can uh, date them uh, well and where there, we're finding large samples of uh, early stone artifacts, Oldowan and Acheulean artifacts and well-preserved fossil bones so that we can use that evidence as uh, a way to reconstruct the behavior of uh, early species in the genus Homo uh, and put that uh, reconstruction in a precise high-resolution paleoecological context. Uh, here we're at site FLK North, uh, which is uh, in bed one and dated to about uh, 1.8 million years before the present. Uh, this is a site where Lewis and Mary Leakey did pioneering work uh, approximately six, uh, 50 years ago and uh, uncovered a series of uh, six archaeological levels, five of which they called uh, living floors or occupation floors because they uh, contain uh, concentrations of uh, older wand stone tools and the fossilized bones of a variety of different uh, large mammals, mostly uh, hoofed mammals, uh, mostly uh, bovids or the antelope family. And what they assumed at the time was that each one of these uh, archaeological living floors represented a uh, camp-like uh, setting where early Homo, working in a cooperative social group, was uh, repeatedly coming back to the precise location of, of the site here and um, uh, making and discarding tools, uh, carrying uh, food remains found elsewhere on the landscape back to this location to, uh, to uh, share with other members of the group and to eat in a, in a way that uh, is for paleoanthropologist, a, uh, a recognizably human uh, rather than ape-like uh, form of behavior. Uh, we're continuing the work at the site uh, because uh, uh, techniques have changed over the past 50 years and uh, so we're applying new techniques and recovering not just more evidence but uh, really novel kinds of evidence from the site. Um, we're trying to uh, refine the geology and paleoecology, uh, and we're trying to really uh, nail down the behavioral reconstructions from the site. Fifty years ago, Mary Leakey and uh, uh, another uh, prominent uh, paleoanthropologist, uh, my own graduate professor, uh, Glenn Isaac, mm. both were evaluating evidence from here and from uh, Kubifora in the Turkana Basin in northern Kenya, uh, about the same age, slightly less than two million years old, and they had different labels for what they were finding. Uh, living floors or occupation floors here, home bases, in the case of Glenn Isaac's yeah. terminology at, at Kubi Fora, but the, the message was the same, that it's, uh, that it's documenting very human-like behavior uh, in early Homo nearly two million years ago, yeah. which is, you know, landmark finding and that was as science goes you know immediately challenged because it 
made early homo with brain sizes about half that of modern people um, too human-like mm. and that's about the time when uh, taphonomy uh, the study of processes affecting bones came into the science involved with analyzing and interpreting this kind of evidence and so scientists started looking at alternative ways to wind up with a concentration of materials on the ground that didn't invoke the sort of human-like interpretations of uh, Leakey and Isaac. In an ancient setting, all we've got is the archaeological traces, and we have to infer that it represents a camp-like setting or some other kind of uh, behavioral setting. And so in the case of a living floor, uh, because there were the remains of multiple animals along with stone tools, the Leakeys could logically assume that there were live hominins here, that they were making, using, and discarding stone tools, and really guilt by association, uh, the uh, circumstantial uh, evidence in the ground of having all of the animal bones in the same place with the undoubted stone tools implied to the Leakeys that all of the bones were here as a product of hominin foraging activities, that they were byproducts of uh, eating meat. The whole uh, underpinning of our research uh, is to understand how the world works from modern context where we have the luxury of um, direct observation. We can observe cause and effect in a modern setting, whether it's involving behavior by uh, modern people, such as hunting and gathering peoples, or whether it's um, the behavior of uh, large carnivores today, who also uh, obviously uh, kill and eat uh, various large mammals, uh, or whether it's some geological process. So in every case, we're not born understanding what the patterns that we can, of evidence that we can excavate from the ground uh, actually mean. We have to gain perspective by looking in a modern context at how the world works. And uh, in the case of, of a living floor, uh, the closest modern analog for that is uh, what uh, hunting and gathering peoples do, or what any, any group of people do when they want to camp out in a, in a natural setting. Uh, you set up shop, basically, in a, in a comfortable place. Uh, you, in a case of a campsite, you you, you live on the spot, uh, on the ground, uh, typically around a campfire, and you're eating and you're making a mess on the ground, and, uh, and then you leave. And if that gets buried and preserved, you've got uh, a pattern of archaeological evidence typical of a campsite. And in a modern setting, of course, we have the uh, ability to link up what we know the behavior was to what we can excavate and identify as a pattern of archaeological evidence. Paleoanthropologists, uh, particularly archaeologists, recognized that um, there are other processes in nature that can produce accumulations of bones. And so while this, the accumulation of stone tools is, is really uh, uh, undisputed, uh, what became a uh, research issue rather than an established fact was determining how the bones of the various animals got here. If hominins were the, the cause through repeated use of the same location as a, as a home base, then it has the implications that were already described by uh, Glenn Isaac and the Leakeys. But there are other taphonomic processes, taphonomy being the processes affecting bones, in nature. Now, there are other taphonomic processes that can produce accumulations of bones. Uh, one approach is to uh, look at um, bone damage produced by humans using stone tools. So cut marks or butchery marks from slicing up the animals, cutting meat off of the bones, skinning the animals, cutting the joints apart, which show, show up on the bones uh, like they would show up on your wooden cutting board at home. Things you can hold up and see with your naked eye. Uh, others, others have looked at um, uh, the gnawing damage that carnivores leave on bones uh, with the 
underlying thinking that, well, if there's plenty of carnivore damage on the bones, then hominids didn't do all of those human-like things two million years ago, and that the bones had nothing to do with human behavior. So those are two extremes, and there's some middle ground in between those. For example, we go out to a you know, modern uh, hunter-gatherer camp and uh, find that the carnivores in the vicinity, you know, there's the, there's the, the people uh, making a very smelly mess, you know, from what they're eating. And that goes on for weeks or months, and then, you know, every, every carnivore in the vicinity knows that there's nothing to eat in the camp, and they can't do anything about it because the people are there, you know, armed with bows and arrows, and they'll shoot and eat the hyenas or whatever as well. But as soon as the people leave, I mean, at, like, within hours, if not faster than that, in come the hyenas, just scrounging through what's left on the ground. And not only taking bones away, uh, but also gnawing bones that are present on the site. And so, with that kind of understanding that we gain from looking at the modern setting, where we, can, we have the luxury of direct observation, um, we, we, can, we can take that knowledge and reevaluate these early sites. The uh, implication is that uh, we can't just assume because we find the bones with the stone tools, we can't assume that they're both byproducts of hominin behavior. We have to demonstrate whether or not that's the case. At some sites here at Old Dubai, uh, notably the FLK Zinge site uh, near, nearby here, um, that turns out to be the case because uh, as a taphonomist, uh, one of the uh, working hypotheses that I developed starting uh, back in the mid-1970s in uh, analyzing the uh, bone collections made by the leakies was that if early homo was responsible for the bones and for butchering, transporting them, butchering them, and then uh, eating the edible parts, meat and marrow, for example, uh, then there should be traces on the bones from the use of stone tools to, to, to do those activities. And it turned out that at FLK Zinge, that was the case. There's a large sample of bones that have knife-like uh, slicing marks or cut marks uh, on them from skinning, from uh, dismembering, and particularly from defleshing uh, most of the animals found there. So there are nearly 50 dead animals represented at FLK Zinge in a very thin, uh, uh, 10 centimeter thick uh, archaeological level uh, with stone tools and uh, and so uh, that provides a very strong case that hominins were in fact responsible for not only cutting meat off of the bones but because of hammerstone damage on the bones uh, also uh, in breaking open the bones um, by uh, uh, just pounding them with with stone uh, cobbles uh, to access the fat rich marrow uh, inside them. So, so that's, uh, that's a site that really does meet the basic uh, definitions of a, of a home base or living floor. Other sites, such as the one that we're working on here, FLK North, as it's called, uh, from a distance resembles a living floor, and which is why the Leakeys uh, reached that conclusion uh, so long ago, um, because it has a decent concentration of stone tools, over a thousand uh, pieces from the uppermost, the richest archaeological level here, uh, and it has the remains of uh, more than 50 uh, dead large animals, which is more than you find concentrated by most natural processes. And so they reached the conclusion that it was another uh, living floor. Uh, taphonomic analysis, however, uh, quickly uh, dispelled that uh, assumption uh, because in the very locations on bones where there are abundant defleshing cut marks at FLK Zinge, also uh, a bad one site, uh, there are few uh, at FLK North. Out of over 10,000 bones recovered from FLK North by the Leakeys and by our excavations, uh, there are only about 20 or so bones with cut marks. 
contrasted to uh, the sample at FLK Zinj, where there are 3,500 identifiable bones, but over 250 bones with cut marks. So a very different uh, uh, taphonomic history to the two sites. This site resembles a home base, but taphonomic analysis yields uh, very few traces of butchery. 20 or so bones with cut marks, one, a grand total of one bone uh, with hammerstone uh, percussion damage on it. Um, limb bones, marrow rich bones, are abundant at this site, uh, but uh, the ones that are broken are broken by hyenas, with one exception, and uh, many of the limb bones here are found in uh, whole condition, uh, indicating that they were never exploited by either hominins or by uh, hyenas or other carnivores for the uh, marrow uh, inside them. Our team geologist Gail Ashley from Rutgers has uh, discovered the evidence of freshwater springs producing marshes uh, near our Bed 1 sites, uh, including FOK North, making it a, a, an attractive place for uh, all animals seeking water to drink, uh, but also uh, a place supporting lush vegetation in an otherwise fairly dry, grassy landscape, so that the, the, the spring provided a magnet for large herbivores to eat the plants, for large carnivores to eat the herbivores, all in the same spot here. And then uh, the role of hominins comes into play. Being anthropologists, that's the, the thing that we're most interested in. And it turns out that the hominins were coming to the location, leaving stone tools behind, uh, but butchering very few bones. So what does that mean? It means that it might technically meet the definition of a, of a home base or living floor because there are a few butchered bones with the stone tools. But the, the real essence of the site seems to be that it was a location where large carnivores, specifically members of the cat family or felids, like lions or leopards or saber-toothed cats, uh, were repeatedly killing and eating animals here. And uh, the remains of those uh, carnivore meals were uh, winding up on the ground in a dense concentration. Uh, hyenas then scavenged through some of those remains and broke some of the bones for, for marrow. And then after all of that w had happened, then hominins came into the location and left some stone tools here and uh, uncommonly uh, butchered animals. Not so much for marrow, but occasionally for meat. This site seems to have been, as far as hominins were concerned, a foraging site on the landscape where during their daily uh, activities, hominins occasionally visited the location for exploiting whatever plant or animal resources and water that they could obtain here, but then left for a more appealing destination uh, elsewhere, uh, rather than uh, setting up shop here during the heat of the day in the shade, for example. Uh, and um, establishing this as a, as a living floor. So it's an interesting uh, and contrastive kind of site uh, that helps us build a, a more complete picture of what uh, hominins were doing here at Old Divide.